So, out of all the leaders in ancient times who had to deal with such difficulties, none stand out more than Moses. Okay? I'm going to come in close for more of an effect. Moses. No, but I am going to try to do more gesticulating and, um, I don't know, just reading isn't, isn't enough. You know, it's got to be more. There's got to be more. So, Moses. Moses was chosen by God to lead the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt and to the promised land. Although the Hebrews had suffered in Egypt, they had relative security. Moses had wrestled, wrested from them, wrested from them this predictable life and set them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness where they were plagued by a lack of food, shelter, and basic comforts. They constantly doubted Moses and they even came to hate him. Some plotted to kill Moses as the king who needed to be sacrificed. They saw him as an oppressor and a madman. To aid his cause, God would perform regular miracles to show that Moses was chosen and blessed. But these miracles were quickly forgotten, and the Hebrews kept resorting to their endless complaining and recalcitrance. To overcome the seemingly impossible obstacles in this path, Moses resorted to a unique, unique situation. He united the twelve constantly divided tribes around a single simple cause, one God to worship, and the attainable goal of reaching the promised land. One goal. One unified vision. So Moses wasn't there for power or glory, but merely just wanted to lead them to this much desired goal. Mo Moses could not afford to absent himself for a day or two or to ease up on his leadership. The tribes were continually prone to doubt him and forget the larger picture, the reason for their suffering. The Hebrew word for lead means to be out in front, to drive. He had to be out there constantly in the vanguard, unifying them around his vision of the promised land. This meant being ruthless with internal dissenters, putting whole families to death that stood in the way of the larger cause. In essence, Moses learned to play a role for the Hebrews, the man who is possessed of a vision from God, indomitable in spirit and acting for the greater good. A normal tribe member would have to ask him or herself if this promised land was not something that existed merely in Moses' mind. The force of his conviction and determination to lead people to the promised land made it hard to doubt him. He had to play this role to the hilt to convince them that his top position was legitimate and that it was sanctioned by God. His ability to lead such a fra fractious group for some 40 years had to be considered the greatest masterpiece of leadership in history. We moderns believe we have moved far beyond our primitive tribal or origins. After all, we live in a secular, rational world. A leader today needs to possess certain technical and managerial skills. But 3,000 years of civilization have not altered human nature. And in fact, the endless difficulties that plague such leaders as Moses have only become more acute. Whereas we humans might think first of the tribe, we now primarily think of ourselves, our careers, and our narrow interests. Office politics is the extreme endpoint of this trend. We are now more distracted than ever with thousands of bits of information competing for our attention in the course of a day. This makes us less patient and capable of seeing the larger picture. If we were being led out of slavery, we would not be able to focus on the promised land for more than a few minutes. We are much more skeptical when it comes to those in authority. We still feel the ancient ambivalence towards rulers. Instead of sacrificing them, we feed them to the press and secretly gloat in their downfall. To be a leader now means overcoming these aspects of human nature while still seeming to be fair and decent, an almost impossible, impossible task. At the same time, however, people feel this division and selfishness as a depressing phenomenon. They desperately want to believe in a cause, to work for their greater good, to follow a leader who imbues them with a sense of purpose. They are more then receptive to this kind of quasi-religious leadership that Moses embodies. As the one on top, you must rid yourself of your modern prejudices, your fetishism of technical means. To be a leader, to be a leader, still means that you're playing a role. 
out in the, out in the front, <laughs> fearlessly driving the group forward. If you fail to unify the group around some glorious call, some equivalent of the promised land, then you'll find that you're having to push and pull your followers who are constantly splitting up into factions. <coughs> Instead, you must assume a prophetic air, as if you were merely chosen to lead them towards some higher goal. You're compelling them to follow on their own, making less of a show of personal power and more a demonstration of the cause that unites them all. This will give you the proper authority to lead and an aura of power. To master the art of leadership, you must see yourself as playing certain parts that will impress your disciples and make them likely to follow you with the unnecessary, with the necessary enthusiasm. The following are the four main roles that you must perform. The visionary. The beginning of the 20th century, Thomas Alva Edison was seen as America's pre preeminent inventor and scientist. His research labs were the source of some of the most important technological breakthroughs of all time. But the truth is that Edison himself only had a few months of formal education, and he wasn't a scientist at all. Edison wasn't no scientist. Instead, he was a mixture of a visionary, a strategist, and a shrewd businessman. So Thomas Edison, he wasn't a scientist. He didn't know how to invent shit. He just knew how to be a businessman and how to exploit other people's inventions, like Tesla. So, Thomas Alva Edison... His method was simple. What he did, he, was, he would scour the globe and he looked at all the latest advances in technology and science. And with his understanding of business and the latest social trends, he thought long and hard about how some of these advances could be translated into products with great commercial appeal that could transform how people live. Electricity lighting up cities, improved telephones altering the course of commerce, motion pictures entertaining the masses. He would then hire the best minds in these fields to bring to life his ideas. Every product that came through his lab was inevitably stamped with Edison's particular vision and sense of marketing. Understand, a group of any size must have goals and long-term objectives to function properly. But human nature serves as a great impediment to this. We're naturally consumed by immediate battles and problems. We find it very difficult, if not unnatural, to focus with any depth on the future. Thinking ahead requires a particular thought process that comes with practice. It means seeing something practical and achievable several years down the road and mapping out how this goal can be achieved. It means thinking in branches and coming up with several paths to get there, depending on circumstances. It means being emotionally attached to this idea so that when a thousand distractions and interruptions seem to push you off course, you've got the strength and the purpose to keep at it. Without one person on top who charts the way to this larger goal, the group will wander here and there, grasping at schemes for quick money, or they'll be moved by the narrow political aspirations of one member or another, and they'll never accomplish anything. You are the leader who are the only bulwark against this endless wandering. You must have the strength to stamp the group with your own personality and vision, giving it a core and an identity. If you lose sight of the larger picture, then only bad things will ensue. You must play this visionary role with some dramatic flair, like Edison, who is a consummate performer and promoter. He'd give dazzling presentations of his ideas, and he would stage events to get on the front page of newspapers. Just like Moses describing the promised land, he could paint an alluring picture of the future that his inventions would help create. This drew in money from investors and inspired his researchers to work even harder. So, your own level of, of excitement and self-belief will convince people that you know where you're going and that you should be followed. The Unifier. When Louis the Fourteenth, which is what I want to say Louisville is named after, Louis the Fourteenth, the same guy who got his head beheaded, he got his head chopped off in the French Revolution, the pinnacle, the apex, the greatest revolution that had happened, the one that studied above, best, and beyond all other revolutions, including our own powdered, wig-wearing, slave-owning revolutionaries here in America over 200, 1776 is what, 240 years ago? So over, over two centuries ago? Nobody's lifetime, nobody remembers that. 
So Louis the Fourteenth, he was ruling France in 1661. <laughs> I want to almost say that it's not the same Louis. <laughs> 1661, I think the French Revolution was in the 1800s. So, I take all I said back. <laughs> uh, the, the Louis, the King Louis that did get his head chopped off, you know, fuck him. So, Louis XIV began ruling France in 1661. He inherited an almost impossible situation. The feudal dukes and lords of France maintained tight control over their various realms. Recent ministers, such as the Duke de Richelieu and Cardinal Mazarin, had made the most of important decisions that lay outside the control of the lords. The king had been uh, mostly a figurehead presiding over a deeply fractured country whose power in Europe had been on the decline for so quite some time. Louis was determined to reverse all of this, and his method was powerful and dramatic. At first he kept his intentions to himself, and then suddenly he announced to one and all that he would not appoint a minister to run the country. From now on, that would be his task. Next he ordered the aristocracy to take up residence in the place of Versailles that he had recently constructed. The closer that they lived to him in the palace, the more influence they would have. And if they remained in their duchies, <laughs> their duchies and to conspire against him, they would find themselves isolated from the new center of power that he had created. His most brilliant maneuver, however, was the most subtle one of all. He call, created a cause for the French people to believe in, the greatness and glory of France itself, which had as its, as its mission to be the center of civilization and refinement, the model for all of Europe. And we could do this for Louisville. We could do it for Kentucky. Kentucky should be the center of civilization. Kentucky should be the center of refinement. Kentucky should be leading in civilization and, re and refinement. While we have our issues and our problems, that puts us into a more desperate situation. And desperate situations can... Uh, the only, only solutions to desperate problems is desperate solutions. So we should be willing to take the risk that we need to make Kentucky a better state. So we should be like Louis the Fourteenth. <laughs> so Louis the Fourteenth graded a cause for the people to believe in the greatness and glory of France itself, the model for all of Europe. For this purpose, he led the country into various wars to extend France's political might. He became the preeminent patron of the arts, making France the cultural envy of Europe. He created and it created impressive spectacles to delight and distract the public from his power moves. The nobility were not fighting for Louis, but for the greatness of the nation. In this way, he transformed a deeply divided, almost chaotic country into the supreme power of Europe. So understand, the natural dynamic of any group is a splinter into factions. People want to protect and to promote the, their narrow interests. So they form political alliances from, alliances from within. If you force them to unite under your leadership, stamping out the factions... You may take control, but it will come with great resentment. They will naturally suspect you're increasing your power at their expense. Yeah, but if you do nothing, you'll find yourself surrounded by lords and dukes who will make your job impossible. So what do you do? A group needs a centripetal, a centripetal force to give unity and cohesion. And it's not enough to have that you, be you. It's not enough to have that be you in the force of your personality. Instead, it should be a cause that you fearlessly embody. It could be political, ethical, or progressive. You're working to improve the lives of people in your community. For instance, this cause elevates your group above others. It has a quasi-religious aura to it, a kind of cult feeling. Now, to fight or doubt you from within is to stand against this cause and to seem selfish. The group infused with this belief system will tend to police itself and root out the troublemakers. To play this role effectively, you must be a living example of this cause. Much as Louis exemplified the civilizing power of France in his own carefully crafted behavior. So, so be like Louis XIV and craft a vision for other people to believe in. Be a visionary. Fight for revolution.